Very good morning, uh, my dear students. I welcome to the second class. So, this is what the subject I am dealing with design of RCC structural elements 10 CV 52. And uh, in the yesterday's class, uh, we have seen as to what uh, a column is, we also have seen as to what different types of columns we have depending on the shape of the column, depending on the type of the lateral reinforcement, and also depending on the length of the column, we have seen the classification and also I have given a brief introduction to how the unsupported length of the column can be defined and based on the unsupported length, how the other properties of the column can be defined and uh, what is the concept of slenderness ratio and things like that. And today we will be seeing regarding the compression member, the main outcome of this uh, present class is the student will be able to understand the various end conditions of the compression members. In fact, I have just started this in the previous class and you will be seeing uh, the various specifications of uh, the reinforcement in column as per IS uh, 456 2000 and also some of the assumptions in the limit state of collapse in compression very relevant to the design of uh, column. So, this is what I was uh, discussing in the previous class, the degree of end restraint of a compression member we have seen as to how these things can be identified uh, graphically and this is uh, mainly valid for individual column elements and I am not discussing uh, how to calculate the effective length of column in a framed structure and we will see more about this uh, uh, later. The following are the different uh, end restraints for the column. So, ends can be fixed or hinged or free, it can be partially fixed or it can be partially free also. Now, I have taken uh, the extract from uh, IS 456 2000. In fact, in the appendix, uh, students can find uh, all this information and definitely in the examination, uh, so this can be referred. And here we have uh, two information. One is uh, the theoretical value of the effective length as given by the Euler equations. This is what we have seen in the previous class also based on the nature of the buckling of the column and this is what the value recommended uh, for the effective length to be considered in the design and these are the degree of uh, end restraints of the column, the compression member. Now, let us see the first uh, condition effectively held in position and restrained against rotation in both ends. So, at the top as well as at the bottom, it is held in position and also restrained against rotation means uh, the top is fixed and the bottom is also fixed. If this is the situation, the distance between the point of Contraflexure is uh, 0.5, this is the theoretical value. So, obviously, we need to use this practical value which is slightly more than the theoretical value and this is 0.65. Now, similarly, we can see in the figure, so this is actually fixed, held in position, restrained against rotation and uh, this particular top end, it is held in position only but unrestrained as far as this rotation is concerned. So, how to define these two conditions? Effectively held in position at both ends restrained against rotation at one end. So, one end is hinged and the other end is fixed. The theoretical value is uh, 0.7 times the unsupported length, but whereas uh, the recommended value for the design is 0 0.8 times of the length. This is uh, actual uh, length of the column, which is also called as the unsupported length of the column. Now, for the other end conditions also, we have uh, all these details available in uh, IS code. I am not going into the greater details, but you can see here in the figure, this is uh, hinged, this is also hinged, means uh, both ends are held in position, but unrestrained in uh, direction. Effectively held in position at both ends, but not restrained against rotation. So, the theoretical value and also the recommended value, both are equal to one times of the actual length of the column. Actual length of the column is L, that is also sometimes taken as the unsupported length of the column. Now, similarly, if one end of the column is fixed, that is the bottom is fixed, uh, but the top is free. In what way the top is free, that is to be identified. Now, if you can see in the figure, so the column is undergoing translation, but there is no rotation. So, the initial condition of the top and the final condition of the top as far as rotation is concerned is not going to change. Effectively held in position and restrained against rotation at one end, that is what we have here fixed and the other restrained against rotation, but not held in position. So, that is the reason why the position is uh, changing from this to this means there is a translational effect 
but rotational effect is not there and if this is a situation, so theoretical value is 1 times the unsupported length which is the actual length but we have to take 1.2 times of uh, the unsupported length as the recommended uh, effective length for the design. And similarly, if this is a situation, there is not much of a difference between this and this, uh, but here it is fixed, but there is a partial rotation as well. So, there is a translational effect and also the rotational effect. Effectively held in position and restrained against rotation in one end and at the other partially restrained against rotation, but not held in position. So, if this is a situation, so the recommended value is uh, 1.5 times of L. This is also very similar to the previous one, but uh, the bottom in the previous case was fixed, but here it is hinged, but here only a translational effect, but uh, translational effect is there and also you can see here, if you can draw the tangent, uh, so it is almost straight and is equal to the initial length of the column, means uh, there is no rotational effect. Effectively held in position at one end, but not restrained against rotation and at the other end, restrained against rotation, but not held in position. So, the theoretical value is 2 times of the actual length, so the recommended value is uh, 2. So, if this is the situation fixed at the bottom, so whereas at the top we have not only translation, we also have the rotation. If you can draw the tangent at this point, uh, so there is a rotation. So, effectively held in position and restrained against uh, rotation at one end, but not held in position, nor restrained against rotation at the other end. So, the theoretical value is 2 and the recommended value is also 2. Now, coming to the effective length of the columns in frames, as I told I am not going to the details. So, many a times in practice uh, we deal with columns. So, where we have the restraints at the top and bottom because of the presence of uh, the columns of the upper story and also because of the presence of primary beams and secondary beams. And in that situation, uh, so we have to refer to IS 456-2000 for details. But just to tell you in brief, uh, so the effective length of a column of any frame mainly depends on the end conditions of the column and also it depends on the relative stiffness of the columns in relation to the stiffness of the beams at the bottom and as well as at the top for any column you are considering. And these two things are represented by alpha 1 and alpha 2. In fact, equations are available for alpha 1 and alpha 2 in IS456 and based on this alpha 1 and alpha 2, we have to calculate the effective length factor beta 1 and beta 2 as given by the formula from the IS456 and the lesser of the 2 beta 1 and beta 2 is the actual effective length factor to be used in the design. Again, it depends on whether the column is a, a braced column or an unbraced column. So, if it is a braced column, so the effective length factor definitely should be less than 1. If it is unbraced, it should be definitely greater than 1. So, in fact, all these things are also available in the form of graphs in IS456-2000 and these are called as Wood's charts and from that the effective length of column of a frame in any practical uh, situation can be identified. Now, let us see one important concept uh, called uh, the slenderness limits for the column. So, what type of column you will be dealing with? So, we have to deal with short column and also we have to deal with long columns, but as far as your examination is concerned, it is only the short column but uh, there is a limitation on the slenderness limits for the column. So, a column can be slender, but the slenderness ratio should not be more than certain limits. So, this is what the code has uh, given. So, in fact, uh, this is also referred to as uh, the limit state uh, for the slenderness limit. So, similar to the limit state of collapse, limit state of serviceability. So, it is a serviceability limit state where the limit is imposed on the slenderness of the column. Now, as far as uh, the slenderness limit is concerned, so the unsupported length LU between the end restraints, you kindly see between the end restraints. So, obviously, it is something connected with the top and bottom shall not exceed 60 times the least lateral dimension of the column. Now, for example, if uh, the width of the column is uh, 300, for example, if you have 300 by 400 column, so 300 is what the least lateral dimension and 60 times of 300 if you calculate, uh, so that is what uh, the unsupported length. So, the unsupported length should not exceed that value. So, this is only for uh, the column having two end restraints, but sometimes the column will have only one restraint, but other is unrestrained. In that situation, in any given plane, one end of the column is unrestrained. Its unsupported length LU shall not exceed 100 into B square divided by D. So, B is the 
width of the cross section and D is depth of the cross section measured in the plane under consideration. So, by chance uh, if the limit exceeds these values depending on the type of the end restraints uh, then the column will be subjected to torsion effects also in addition to axial force and bending moment depending on the situation. So, definitely such columns are need to be treated in a different form. And let us uh, switch over to the specifications uh, as per IS 456 2000. So, regarding uh, the various reinforcements in column. So, in column basically we have two types of reinforcement. The main reinforcement is called as uh, the longitudinal reinforcement, the reinforcement running along the length of the column and connecting all these reinforcements. We have the reinforcement uh, in the lateral direction uh, as well and these are called as uh, laterals. In fact, we have ties used as laterals and also sometimes uh, spirals are used as lateral reinforcement. So, let us see the specifications in connection with uh, not only the longitudinal reinforcement, but also the transverse reinforcement. So, let us consider the longitudinal uh, reinforcement. So, the first specification or the point to be remembered is that the cross sectional area of the longitudinal reinforcement, it should be greater than 0.8 percent means the 0.8 percent happens to be the minimum area of the longitudinal reinforcement, whereas uh, the maximum percentage uh, is limited to 6 percent. So, in other words, it should be less than or equal to 6 percent of the gross cross sectional area of the column. So, if it is a rectangular column, it is B into D and in case of square columns, the dimension square and in case of circular columns depending on the diameter. So, we have to calculate the gross area pi d square by 4 is what the area and 0 0.8 percent to 6 percent is what the range of the longitudinal reinforcement you can think of. But there is a small restriction as far as uh, this 6 percent is this 6 percent is uh, concerned. This is available in your IS456 as a note. The use of 6 percent may involve practical difficulties in placing and compacting of concrete. Hence, a lower value of 4 percent is recommended. In fact, this is what the situation when this code was drafted, maybe at that uh, point of time, high performance concrete uh, though available was not used much in practice, but today if you see, so we have a very good concrete available, new generation concretes are available, high performance concretes are available. In fact, uh, the compaction is really not a problem in uh, the present day concreting. If that is a situation, definitely you can go up to 6 percent. So, it is always better to restrict the amount of reinforcement to 4 because still happens to be the costly material compared to concrete. The second specification is in any column that has a larger cross sectional area than that required to support the load, the minimum percentage of steel shall be based upon the area of the concrete required to resist the direct stress and not upon the actual area. But sometimes it so happen that uh, we will be providing the minimum reinforcement say 0 0.8 percent of the gross area, but based on certain consideration we give the area slightly more than what is required. In that case 0 0.8 percent of what the area that is really required to resist the load is uh, the specification and not based on what actual area of the column you are going to provide. The third point is the minimum number of longitudinal bars provided in a column shall be 4 in rectangular. In fact, it is true for square as well and in case of circular columns it is 6 in number. But if we take uh, the polygonal shape, if it is a hexagonal minimum of 6 number, if it is a pentagon a minimum of 8 uh, and depending on the number of sides uh, we have to have the number of column, number of bars in the column if the shape is uh, polygonal. What is the minimum diameter of the reinforcement in a bar? So, that is what the next specification is. The bar shall not be less than 12 mm in diameter. So, 12 mm and uh, more is what the diameter of the main reinforcement in case of longitudinal steel. The next specification is a reinforced concrete column having helical reinforcement shall have at least 6 bars of longitudinal reinforcement within the helical reinforcement. So, normally helical reinforcement is provided for the uh, circular column and rarely and sometimes a helical reinforcement can also be provided in a square column. So, whatever is the situation, so we have to have minimum of uh, 6 bars as longitudinal reinforcement uh, if you are going for helicals as lateral steels. In a helically reinforced column, the longitudinal bar shall be in contact with the helical reinforcement and equidistant around its uh, inner circumference. So, if you are providing 8 bars, so all the bars should be equidistant uh, from the center 
and at the same time along the periphery also so it should be somewhat symmetric so that is what the meaning of uh, this particular specification and the longitudinal reinforcement always should touch the helical steel spacing of the longitudinal bars measured along the periphery of the column shall not exceed 300 mm so this is another specification to be looked into in fact if the distance is more than 300 mm so we have to introduce one more bar in between such that the distance between any two bars measured should not be more than uh, 300 mm this is not uh, the specification for the column in fact uh, it is for the pedestal so you all know as to what pedestal is it is a very short compression member having a uh, slenderness ratio less than 3 if that is the situation in case of a pedestal in which the longitudinal reinforcement uh, is not taken into account uh, in the strength calculation nominal longitudinal reinforcement not less than 0.15 percent of the gross sectional area shall be provided so in fact 0.15 percent of the cross sectional area is what the minimum reinforcement to be provided in a pedestal this is the last uh, specification now let us say as to what the specifications of uh, the transverse reinforcement so let us take uh, the helical reinforcement uh, first this is regarding the pitch of the helical reinforcement where an increased load on the column on the strength of the helical reinforcement uh, is allowed for the pitch of the helical turns shall be not more than 75 mm nor more than one sixth of the core diameter of the column nor less than 25 mm nor less than three times the diameter of the steel bar forming the helix so this is what uh, the information you have in uh, is456 it is uh, somewhat confusing but if you read it carefully so this is what the meaning of that so the pitch should not be less than at this uh, at the most it is equal to 75 mm and it should be less than one sixth of the core diameter or equal to one sixth of the core diameter so this is what uh, the pitch is and at the same time pitch should not be more than 25 mm nor three times the diameter of the tie or the uh, rod forming the helix so you need to remember this particular thing in fact uh, from 25 to 75 mm or from three times the diameter of the uh, this uh, spiral to one sixth of the core diameter the pitch of the helical reinforcement to be provided so this is what the situation is this is what i was uh, referring to so you can see this is what the circular column and in fact uh, this is what the helix so the, these are the main bars and one of the main bar i have shown here and that is what this particular main bar is so the diameter of the spiral or the continuous bar if you take it as phi and the pitch is 25 mm to 75 mm minimum and it can go up to minimum to maximum or three times the diameter of the spiral to one sixth of the core diameter so this is what the specification we need to follow and the distance between one turn to the next point of the successive turn is what is referred to as the pitch so you can see here in case of helical reinforcement the helix is going round the main reinforcement so that is where the continuous uh, wounding of the bar comes into picture as far as spirals are concerned now let us say as to what this uh, pitch in case of uh, the ties when the lateral reinforcement is in the form of a link or a tie as far as pitch is concerned the pitch of the transfer reinforcement shall not be more than least of the following distances so we need to remember these uh, three important uh, points the least lateral dimension of the compression member the pitch should not be less than this 16 times the smallest diameter of the longitudinal reinforcement to be tied and if we have two different diameters say 20 mm and uh, 25 mm then 20 mm forms the criteria so 16 times the diameter of the main reinforcement but the smallest main reinforcement you have to take or 300 mm whichever is minimum so it should not be less than this it should not be less than this and it should not be less than this obviously minimum of these three things so least lateral dimension 16 times the diameter of the main bar or 300 mm whichever is minimum so here the smallest diameter of the longitudinal bar in case we have different diameters of the longitudinal bars now what should be the diameter of uh, this uh, transverse uh, steel that is the tie so the diameter of the polygonal links uh, or the diameter of the ties shall not be less than one fourth of the diameter of the largest longitudinal bar 
and in no case less than 6 mm. So, in fact, uh, so if you have two different diameters, then it is one fourth of the largest part. If you have 20 and 25, it is 25 by 4, it is not 20 by 4, subjected to a minimum of 6 mm. So, this is what uh, the diameter of the link. Now, let us see how these uh, uh, lateral reinforcement can be arranged. Uh, these are the information according to IS456. So, the first information is if the longitudinal bars are not spaced more than 75 mm on either side, transverse reinforcement need only to go around the corner and alternate bars for the purpose of providing effective lateral support. So, what the meaning of this is? You can see here. So, we have the column, it is a rectangular column. So, we have number of uh, longitudinal bars. So, 6 bars onto one face, another 6 bars onto the other face. And you can see here the distance between the longitudinal bars. If this is less than 75, then you can avoid one of the alternate bars from tying. So, this has been tied. You can see this corner bar and this corner bar. So, this has been tied by providing a link. In fact, we have two links here and this is not tied and this is tied and if you come from here this is tied but this is not tied but this is tied so we have to start from left side and again you have to start from right side if the corner bar is tied corner has to be tied the next one can be untied or you can remove that from providing ties so this is what you can follow provided the distance between the two longitudinal bars is less than 75 if it is more than 75 then all bars are to be tied. Then how exactly it is to be tied? Is it that you have to tie it with a open tie something like this or is that it is to be tied with a closed one? So, this depends on the distance between the two longitudinal bars from corner to corner in one particular direction. So, if this distance if you measure it, if this distance is less than 48 times the diameter of the transverse tie, then these bars can be tied only with the open tie not with the closed tie. So, here alternate bars are tied but with the closed links but here alternate bars are tied but alternately they are tied with uh, open links. So, this is uh, what the specification according to IS. Now, you see that one if the longitudinal bars spaced at a distance of not exceeding 48 times the diameter of the tie are effectively tied in two directions additional longitudinal bars in between these bars need to be tied in one direction by open ties. So, that is what uh, this sketch here you can see here the distance between these two corner bars less than 48 times the diameter of the transverse tie. Obviously, the remaining bars need to be tied, but only with open ties. So, you can also provide uh, the reinforcement uh, at the center of the column you can see here this is somewhat the core of the column. So, we have the longitudinal bars they are equally effective as any other uh, uh, reinforcement of the cross section, but you need to look at these specifications. So, what is the distance of this bar from the corner? So, that has to be identified. Similarly, the reinforcement can also be provided uh, in the form of a closed uh, uh, configuration such that uh, in each of the corner of the column. So, we have a very small column provided. So, in, in such a way that in a big column, so we have something like 4 smaller columns. So, this is uh, another way of providing uh, the mine reinforcement. Now, these are all few more uh, configurations of the reinforcement as we can see here the distance between the corner bar exceeds the 48 times the diameter of the tie. Obviously, we have more concrete in the core. So, we cannot provide a open link. So, we have to provide a close link and at the same time if you see the distance between the successive bars uh, it is greater than 75. So, you cannot uh, remove this from providing a tie you have to provide a tie, but because of the fact that this distance is more than 48 times the diameter. So, we have to provide a close link. So, that is the reason why we have two links here one is uh, the black link what you can see here going around the first four and similarly the blue link again going around the remaining four but these two are common. So, in fact, we have two ties at the same level. So, sometimes we will be having three ties or four ties depending on uh, the total number of bars and all these ties are to be provided at a particular level. The pitch of the ties in that case it is uh, the distance of one set of laterals to another set of 
lateral. So, at a particular place, uh, there may be two or more ties depending on the configuration of the reinforcement. Now, if you see the second one, the distance between the two corner bars, it is less than 48 times the diameter, means we have uh, less concrete to be confined, but we have in between the reinforcement. So, you cannot remove uh, these reinforcement from tying because of the fact that the distance is more than 75. So, you have to tie it, but you have to tie it with open link. So, less concrete, the corner distance is less than 48 times the diameter of the tie, but between the two bars, the distance is more than 75. You have to tie, but you have to tie it with open link. But if you see in this case, so this is more than 48, more concrete comes into picture. The distance between these two bars is more than 75. So, you have to tie this bar, but with a closed link. So, that is the reason why we have a bigger tie and of course, we have one more smaller tie which is in the blue color and both ties are uh, closed ties and this is what the configuration is. Now, if you see here, so the dimension is less than uh, 300, it is something like 300 by 300 column where the distance between the corner bar is uh, less than 48 and one link is sufficient and this is what the simple configuration, but when you have a situation something like this, uh, still the distance is less than 300 mm, but this is less than 75 mm, if that is what the situation, so this one can be eliminated from tying, so this is untied. Now, similarly, so here the distance is more than 75, obviously we need to tie this, but this distance is less than 48 times the diameter of the tie, obviously one open tie is sufficient. So, this is uh, what you need to look at depending on the configuration of the reinforcement. So, just identifying the diameter of the lateral and the pitch of the lateral is not sufficient and depending on how many number of bars you have and also depending on all the specifications, we need to identify how many ties we will be having at a particular level, whether a open tie is sufficient or a additional closed tie is to be provided in addition to one tie going around the corner bars. Now, let us see some more specifications with regard to cover and the reinforcement of the column. Now, as far as uh, the longitudinal reinforcing bar in a column is concerned, the nominal cover shall not be less than 40 mm or less than the diameter of such bar. So, this is uh, something connected with uh, the nominal cover. So, the nominal cover is uh, nothing but uh, the distance from outside of the concrete to the face of the reinforcement. So, that is what is called as the clear cover or the nominal cover. And of course, you also have the concept of effective cover. So, the effective cover is corresponding to the center of the reinforcement where the force in the reinforcement is concentrated. So, this is uh, 40 mm or the diameter of such bars. So, normally we will not be providing diameter more than 40 mm. So, you can presume that the longitudinal reinforcement uh, should have a cover of uh, 40 mm that is sufficient. So, in case of columns having a dimension of uh, 200 mm or under whose reinforcing bars do not exceed 12 mm. So, we need to satisfy both this condition, size of the column is uh, 200 mm or less than 200 mm, but the reinforcing rod do not exceed 12 mm, means it is uh, 12 mm, because the minimum diameter of the bar is uh, 12 mm and you cannot use less than 12 and if it is more than 12, this is not sufficient, means when the diameter is exactly 12 mm and the size is less than 200, then the cover of 40 mm can be reduced to 25 mm. So, the nominal cover of 40 mm in a column comes down to 75 mm, 25 mm. If the dimension is uh, 200 mm or less than that, when the reinforcing rod, the main reinforcing rod, that is the longitudinal bar is uh, uh, not more than 12 mm in diameter. Now, as far as the footing is concerned, the minimum nominal uh, cover is uh, 50 mm. And we also have to identify the cover from the other consideration also. Again, this information is available in uh, IS 456. This is based on the environmental condition or the exposure condition. So, we have the following exposure conditions, mild exposure condition, moderate exposure condition, severe, very severe and extreme. And depending on these exposure condition and based on the durability regarding uh, that exposure, we have to have these minimum covers. So, if the environment become more critical, from the durability point of view, it is better to keep the reinforcement uh, uh, more deeper into the column than to the face of the column. And if it is a mild environment, then 20 mm is what the nominal cover. For moderate, it is 30 mm. 
for severe it is 45 mm, for very severe it is 50 mm and for extreme it is 7 mm. So, this is uh, another way of identifying the nominal cover based on the durability requirements. And also we have the nominal cover to be identified as specified in the code based on uh, the fire exposure and this fire exposure has to be identified based on the fire rating. The nominal cover to meet specified period of fire resistance for all fire rating 0.5 to 0.4 has been covered in the IS 456, a fire rating of 0.5 hour is what the minimum and it can go up to 4 hours also. So, depending on the range of the fire rating, so we have to have the cover, but 40 mm is uh, what the cover that is suggested for 0.5 to 0.4 fire rating. If the fire rating is more than 4 hours, uh, so obviously your column has to withstand that temperature and that fire effect uh, for more than 4 hours, obviously we have to have more cover so that we can safeguard the mine reinforcement from elongation and the subsequent uh, cracking and spalling of the concrete. So, for more details, so we have to refer to IS 456. Now, let us uh, take up the concept of limit state of collapse in compression. So, already the limit state of collapse in fluxure has been covered in the earlier classes by other experts and this is uh, something connected with the column design that is why it is called as uh, limit state of collapse in compression. In fact, we have two mine assumptions uh, being listed in this uh, limit state of collapse under compression in IS 456. In addition to these two assumptions, we have few more assumptions of the fluxure coming into picture because many a times uh, your column is subjected to bending also. So, all these assumptions put together is what the limit state of uh, collapse assumption in compression. So, do not just write these two assumptions listed in IS 456. The maximum compressive strain in concrete in axial compression is taken as 0 0.002, it is also called as 0.2 percent. In fact, uh, in fluxure, this is something like 0 0.0035, 0 0.35 is what the maximum strain in fluxure, whereas in case of compression, it is 0.2 percent or 0 0.002. The second is the maximum compressive strain at the highly compressed extreme fiber in concrete subjected to comp axial compression and bending. So, when you have both axial compression and bending and when there is no tension on the suction shall be 0 0.0035 minus 0 0.7 times the strain at the least compressed extreme fiber. Means, if you are talking of the strain in the highly compressed edge, the highly compressed edge strain is 0 0.0035 minus 0 0.75 times the strain in the least compressed edge. So, this is what the situation for x u the, the depth of the neutral axis is uh, greater than the depth. So, when the neutral axis is going beyond the section. So, this particular thing I will be explaining in more detail uh, when I go to the design of columns subjected to axial load and uniaxial bending. But we have to do the design by using SP 16, but some theory is uh, required uh, to understand the importance of all these things and those things also will be covered as a part of theory. So, before taking the problems. Now, what exactly this particular equation? You can also see in the figure and if this is what the column is and if the column is compressed in this direction. So, we have a shorter direction and also in the longer direction. So, the column is uh, bending with respect to the major axis. You can see here and uh, the load is applied somewhere here at an eccentricity of E x obviously, the column is subjected to axial load at the center and we also have the moment and in that is the case, uh, then this is regarded as highly compressed edge. So, compared to this highly compressed edge, uh, so this is called as least compressed edge means uh, over the entire cross section we have the compression, but there is no tension. So, that is what the meaning of uh, the previous assumption is. The maximum compressive strain at the highly compressed extreme fiber in concrete subjected to axial compression and bending. So, this is a beam column design where the column is subjected to bending in addition to the axial compression and when there is no tension. So, that is what the meaning means. So, at this point which is the least compressed edge, the stress is at the most 0, but not minus. So, if minus means it is negative. So, obviously, the variation of the strain diagram will become bilinear, but here it is some sort of a trapezoidal 
So, both are compression, here it is more compression, here it is less compression. What is the strain at the more compression? And this is mainly because of the bending effect. The absolute value for pure bending is 0 0.0035 minus of 0.75 times uh, what the strain you have at the least compressed edge. So, based on this only, so we have to identify the position of neutral axis and the subsequent derivation of the equations in case of uniaxially loaded columns. They are the two min assumptions given in IS uh, 456 under uh, uh, compression, but if you see there is a note. So, in addition to the above two assumptions, the following assumptions of the flux are also should be considered. So, what these assumptions are? So, in fact, all these things are covered in the beam design, limit state of collapse in flux, but however, I am just uh, uh, repeating some of these uh, assumptions uh, which are relevant for the design of column as well. Plane section normal to the axis remain plane after bending. So, this is to avoid uh, the out of plane bending. The maximum strain in concrete at the outermost compression fiber is taken as 0 0.0035, 0 0.35 percent in bending. So, this is uh, the second one. The relationship between the compressive stress distribution in concrete and the strain in concrete may be assumed to be rectangular, trapezoidal, parabola or any other shape which results in prediction of strength in substantial agreement with the results of the test. So, this must have been covered in the remiss state of collapse in flux. So, any of these shapes can be used, but the shape recommended by IS 456 is rectangular and parabolic. So, a few more assumptions like an acceptable stress strain curve as shown in the figure has to be used. For the design purpose, the compressive strength of the concrete in the structure shall be assumed to be 0 0.67 times the characteristic strength and a partial safety factor of uh, 1.5 shall be applied in addition to this. So, this is uh, what the actual stress in concrete. The tensile strength of the concrete is uh, ignored. So, this is uh, another assumption of the flux. So, valid in uh, compression as well. The stresses in the reinforcements are derived from the representative stress strain curve for the type of the steel used. So, depending on what type of steel, whether it is a mild steel or a HOSD bar, the corresponding stress strain diagram has to be used for the design in order to identify the design stress corresponding to the design strain. So, typical curves are given in IS 456. For the design purpose, a partial safety factor of 1.15 shall be applied. So, this is uh, the same assumption as we have in flux. So, with these assumptions, this is what uh, the shape of the stress block. So, this is the stress and strain diagram. So, this is the point uh, of uh, 0 stress and 0 strain. So, initially the behavior is non-linear. You can see here a non-linear behavior of the stress strain and from this point, uh, so it has been idealized as uh, horizontal. I am not writing the actual stress strain diagram. All these things you must have uh, studied uh, already and corresponding to a strain of uh, 0 0.002. So, this horizontal plateau starts means from 0 to 0 0.002 it is non-linear from 0 0.002 to this point 0 0.0035 the maximum strain in bending it is taken as constant it is horizontal. So, this is what the characteristic uh, value 0.67 and this is uh, the design value. So, 0.447 FCK and in fact, there is one more curve that is something like this, there is a actual curve, actual curve with a strength of F C K and that F C K is what the strength in the laboratory. The laboratory strength of F C K, if you want to convert to the field strength, so that has to be divided by some safety factor. So, that is what is called as a safety factor for converting the laboratory strength to the practical strength. So, F C K divided by 1.5. So, that 1.5 from this point to this point uh, is the safety factor or the factor of safety for the conversion. So, F C K divided by 1.5 with that it is 0 0.67. So, this is the characteristic value in the laboratory. Again you divide, uh, so this is the characteristic value in the field, field. So, divide this value by again 1.5, the partial safety factor for the concrete. Then you get 0 0.446 or 0 0.447 F C K. So, this is what the design strength of the concrete to be used. Uh, in the derivation of uh, the equations, uh, the load carrying capacity of the column in axial compression. 
So, this is what the stress flux. Now, this is what the stress strain diagram that is required for the derivation of the equation, the ultimate load carrying capacity of the column. And uh, in the assumption, we have just now seen that uh, the maximum strain in concrete is uh, 0 0.2 percent, that is 0 0.002. So, when the column is subjected to a strain of 0 0.002, concrete is also subjected to 0 0.002, and at the same time, steel also will have a strain of 0 0.002. So, corresponding to this 0 0.2 percent of strain in the column, what is the stress in the concrete that has been identified earlier? Then, what is the stress in the steel? The stress in the steel means uh, at this particular point. So, that corresponds to 0.87 times of F i provided you are using plane bars or the mild steel having F e 250. Means, uh, so this mild steel will yield at a strain of uh, approximately 0.0011. So, that can be identified as 0.87 F i divided by E s, where F i is 250, 0.87 into 250 divided by the Young's modulus of steel 2.1 into 10 to the power of 5. If you use it, so you get a strain of about 0 0.00109 and very close to 0 0.001, in other words 0.1 percent. So, 0.1 percent being the yield strain of steel, but when the concrete is subjected to a maximum strain of 0 0.002, so definitely your mild steel has yielded with a yield stress of 0.87 F5. So, that is what the design strength of steel in case of mild steel bars. Now, if you have a HYSD bar, so we have three different types of HYSD bar. It can be IS, sorry, it, it could be FE 4 and 5 or it could be 500 or FE 550. So, these are the three types of HYSD bars uh, uh, specified in your uh, IS 456. You can also have uh, uh, different bars uh, uh, you can uh, produce uh, uh, from the factory and depending on uh, the yield strength, we need to identify as to what is the stress in the steel corresponding to a strain of uh, 0 0.002. Now, if you take one particular uh, stress strain diagram as applicable for uh, FE 4 and 5, a HYSD type, it is not simply YSD, it is HYSD high yield strength deformed bars or it could be even uh, cold worked bar and I have taken FE 4 and 5 type. Now, corresponding to a strain of 0 0.002, so if you draw a line parallel to the initial portion of the stress strain diagram. So, you will be able to identify the yield strength because there is no significant uh, yield point in case of HYST. So, this is what the point corresponding to 4 on 5 that is the yield stress and if you divide that by 1.15. So, we are going to get the design strength. So, this is what the design strength of 0 0.87 F y, but that 0 0.87 F y corresponds to this strength. So, this is something like 0 0.004, very close to 0 0.004 is what the strain for the yielding of HYSD bar, but what the stress we have to use in the derivation is the stress corresponding to 0 0.002. So, corresponding to this 0 0.002, if you draw an ordinate, a straight line, you see here that point corresponds to some point along the nonlinear portion of the stress strain diagram. So, corresponding to that, what is the design strength? So, the design strength if you see here, it is uh, very close to 340 or so only when you have F e 4 on 5. So, what this 340 in relation to F e 4 on 5? So, that is what the design stress and that design stress is taken as 0.75 times of uh, F y. In case of plane bar 0.87 F y, whereas in case of H y s d bar, it is approximately 0.75 times of F y, but in fact, uh, it is a function of what type of uh, uh, steel you are going to take and corresponding to that strain, the stress has to be identified from the stress strain diagram only. Otherwise, approximately 0 0.75 is what the value recommended by the code. So, we also have uh, one important concept called as uh, the minimum eccentricity concept. So, all columns need to be designed for uh, this minimum eccentricity. All members in compression shall be designed for the minimum eccentricity in accordance with uh, IS456, the mother code for uh, concrete. All columns shall be designed for a minimum eccentricity equal to the unsupported length of the column by 500 plus lateral dimension of the column divided by 30 subjected to a minimum of 20 mm. Means, uh, you have to design all your column for a minimum eccentricity of 20 mm 
or the eccentricity as given by this formula unsupported length divided by 500 plus the lateral dimension divided by 30. If you have a rectangle or column, you have two lateral dimension, one is B, small b, width of the column, capital D, depth of the column. So, you have to always define what the unsupported length, which is the clear height of the column. So, knowing the clear height of the column and knowing the end conditions, we have to identify the effective length of the column. Only when the effective length of the column is known, it is possible to identify whether the column is short or long, that is slender. So, many a times we assume that the column is short but we will not be checking for the minimum eccentricity. So, we have to always check for minimum eccentricity equal to unsupported length by 500 plus lateral dimension divided by 30. Now, as far as the unsupported length is concerned, we have two unsupported length, one perpendicular to the major axis and another one is perpendicular to the minor axis that is L u x and L u y. So, L u x corresponds to capital D and L u y corresponds to B. So, we have two minimum eccentricities, one with respect to x axis, another with respect to the y axis. So, these two values always be compared with 20 mm. So, 20 is the minimum. If the formula gives less than 20, so we have to design for 20, not only in x direction, even with respect to y direction. If it is more than 20 mm, so then that higher value comes into picture and uh, corresponding value in the x direction and also in the y direction are to be considered. But when you are designing the column for the biaxial bending, in case of biaxial bending, so we have the axial load plus two moments m u x and m u y. So, in that case, you have to identify the eccentricity associated with the two bending moments. If that eccentricity is more than the minimum eccentricity, then you need not have to consider this minimum eccentricity. So, we have to design the biaxially loaded column for the axial load plus two moments. But if those two moments are less than the moments given by this minimum eccentricity, then you need not have to worry about the moment. It means uh, you have to design the column as if it is a axially loaded column. So, only when the eccentricity is more than the column need to be designed either as a uniaxially loaded column or as a biaxially loaded column depending on the order of the eccentricity and the corresponding moments. Now, this is uh, what the formula for the axially loaded uh, compression member. The minimum eccentricity as per IS456 does not exceed 0 0.05 times the lateral dimension. The member may be designed by the following equation. So, we have to read this sentence very carefully. Code says that all column need to be designed for minimum eccentricity. What is the minimum eccentricity that is really permitted by this particular equation? as long as the minimum eccentricity is not exceeding 0.5 times the lateral dimension, then this particular formula can be used. So, this formula has taken the minimum eccentricity into consideration, but that minimum eccentricity should be very small as given by this 0 0.05 times the lateral dimension. In fact, the minimum eccentricity exceeds this 0 0.05 times the lateral dimension, then this formula cannot be used. So, this formula always overestimates in such situation because there is a bending effect. So, in such cases, the load carrying capacity has to be reduced appropriately. Then it is a case of uniaxially loaded column or a biaxially loaded column depending on the situation. As long as this condition is satisfied, designed for minimum eccentricity, but the minimum eccentricity is not greater than 0 0.05 times the lateral dimension, then this is what the formula is. Now, as far as this formula is concerned, the ultimate load carrying capacity of the column is given by 0.4 FCK AC plus 0.67 FY AAC. The first part is the load taken by the concrete, the second part is the load taken by the steel. FCK characteristic strength of concrete, FY characteristic strength of steel, AC area of the concrete alone, it is not the gross area of the column and this is the area of the steel. So, from the gross area of the column, if you subtract the area of the steel ASC, then what we have is the area of the column. So, this is the load taken by the concrete and this is the load taken by the steel. And what is this 0.4? In fact, we have seen 0.446 FCK is the design strength of the concrete in compression. So, the entire cross section is subjected to that uniform maximum stress of 0.446 FCK. 
and the maximum stress in steel is 0.75 in case of mild steel, but that corresponds to a strain of 0.2 percent. But when you go for HYSD bar corresponding to 0.2 percent strain, the design strength of steel or the design stress in the steel is approximately taken as 0.75, but that 0.75 has been reduced to 0.67 and 0.446 has been reduced to 0.4. In other words, the load carrying capacity of the column has been reduced approximately by about 10 to 11 percent. So, 0.446 FCK into 0.9 if you take then it is 0.4 and similarly, the average stress of 0.75 into 0.9 it is 0.67. So, in other words the load carrying capacity of the column subjected to axial load has been approximately reduced by about 10 percent to take care of the minimum eccentricity into consideration and as long as that minimum eccentricity is not exceeding 0 0.05 times the lateral dimension then this formula can be used otherwise it is a case of axially loaded or a biax uniaxially loaded or a biaxially loaded situation. So, friends I will stop at this stage and we will see the some of the important uh, theory related to the design of the column and the problems in the subsequent classes. So, I will stop at this stage in case you have any questions so you can ask. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.